welcome to the season finale of Cooking the Books, Recipes from the Fiction Kitchen with me, Val McDermott. Now, before we go on, I want to correct a misapprehension that's been promulgated by my camera woman here, uh, the videographer, Professor Joe Sharp, who has insisted throughout this season that I am not achieving Nigella. Uh, I would like to say at this point that I am not attempting to achieve Nigella. My mentor, the person I look up to in the kitchen, is not Nigella, but the extraordinary Prue Leaf. Chef, baker, friend, inspiration. So today we're going to do a venison casserole. This is an again one of these recipes that's capable of endless variation. Uh, we have on occasion added Jerusalem artichokes to it, which is delicious. Uh, but has the provocation of Jerusalem artichokes to thunderous uh, applause afterwards. Uh, I've heard people do beetroot with it as well. Mm. Um, I think it would work probably. But uh, anyway, it's, it's a recipe that has say, potential variations. What we've got today is about 600 grams of diced venison, uh, a lovely meat to cook with because it's so lean and delicious. And cooked properly, it just melts in the mouth, breaks down and is lovely. Uh, we've got an onion, we've got a shallot, we've got some garlic, we've got a couple of carrots, we've got pickled walnuts. Oh, exotic. Yeah. And here we've got some rosemary from the garden and a couple of star anise. And the mystery ingredient today is the ancho chilli. We have a couple of ancho chilies here just marinating, soaking up a bit of moisture. The ancho is not a spicy hot chilli, it's, it's more of a smoky almost tobacco -y flavour that, uh, that just adds another dimension to the, the flavour of the stew. Uh, Joe is the expert on chilies in our house and when we went to Mexico a few years ago half our suitcase coming home was full of chilies um, and we've experienced many of them over the years. And the final thing of course is the wine to cook it in. Now Keith Floyd always said you should never cook with something you wouldn't drink yourself so just to be on the safe side it's nine o'clock in the morning. Oh, that's right. It's not nine o'clock in the morning. Don't tell lies. If I can just go back to, back to the chilies, uh, you could use different uh, chilies in this recipe. Uh, chipotle, as I keep coming back to, chipotle is always lovely. Bit hotter, smoky. Um, chili pasta yeah. is also nice. It's quite raisiny, which goes very well with uh, with the venison as well. So you just need to. Um, do, do you want to? Show show your viewers what the chili looks like when it's dry, in case they've not come across one before. So it's it's, it looks it's been, like a large piece of shoe leather, and it still has a wee bit of flexibility in it. But you just um, break it up, take the seeds out, and uh, soak it in some water in some warm water for a wee while. The last time I did something like that on camera was a hyoid bone in Sue <laughs> Sue Black's mortuary, and she said, "See, see the flexibility in this," and I did that, and it snapped. Which yeah. was not the point really. Anyway. Onwards. So we're going to start, as we so often do, with recipes involving different kinds of meat. Uh, we put some oil in the pan to brown the meat. So not our wild, lovely wild garlic oil? You're just, you're... Should we need our lovely wild garlic? I think that might be quite nice. Okay. Do you think it would be quite nice? Let's get our lovely wild garlic oil, which we made ourselves with the lovely wild garlic from the water of Leith. Uh, steeped it for three to four weeks in a big jar with uh, lots of wild garlic and oil and then carefully drained it. And now, just, we have... Just smell it, make sure it's still all right. Oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's a beautiful green oil. Which tastes lovely. You can see that there, beautiful green oil. And while I'm here, I'd like to say we've been delighted by the response from you all on Twitter and Facebook and beyond uh, enjoying the recipes and enjoying sharing time with us in the Fiction Kitchen and the fan mail has been lovely and some of the fan mail has actually become extremely practical. <laughs> Thank you Lucy and Laura. Yeah, you, you just read that and learn Val McDermott. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm going to put raw meat in this pan now. I'm going to carefully not touch it. Here we have finely diced, fairly finely diced. It's not finely diced, it's chunks. It's a chunk, but it's small chunks okay. of venison. And that's going to go in 
Uh, that'll close. be hot. That'll be hot already. That's a, yeah. that pan heats up really quickly. It's not like the other one. Ah. I might have to open the back door so the, the smoke detector doesn't go off. Oh. This is burning very quickly because this is a hot ring and it's a pan that conducts heat very well. So let's just take this off the heat. Um, yeah, sadly we've had to give up on our other pan because the yeah. non-stick's coming off. The non-stick, the 10 year guaranteed non-stick, isn't it? Yeah, i have to go back to the shop once they reopen. Aye, these fancy lifestyle shops for you. Yeah. Okay, a little bit more oil, I think. The well, there's very... very lean meat, so you do need to give it a wee bit of help. help. Yeah, I was about to say that. So here we go again. The second batch of the venison. Again, you'll see I'm carefully not touching it because that got me into so much trouble before. I do keep telling the, the professor that, you know, in all the years we've been together, I've never given her food poisoning. I've not always been well after a meal. Many of them cooked by yourself. You can see the venison just changing colour. And that's all we're doing at this stage. We don't want it to cook through, we just want it to seal, seal on the outside. And it doesn't have to be 100% perfect all the way on every piece, but just generally browned off. Which is you know, what I often feel when I look at Twitter. Now we've browned the venison, what we need to do is prep the vegetables so we're ready to roll. is always how much garlic to add in these kind of recipes. Uh, my general principle is double the number you first thought of. But in this instance, we've got three large cloves of garlic and that's what I'm going to go with. And that's very garlicky garlic. It is very garlicky garlic. I've never seen you look like you've got quite the level of concentration as you do right now. Really? You've not been paying much attention then, have you? <laughs> You're not generally in my office while I'm writing my books. So, time to do some chopping. Are you ready? Do it slowly. I can speed it up later. You don't need to show off just now. It's a very big shallots. You said you wanted me to give you a big shallot. A few of these and that shallot. <laughs> okay. So, an onion, a shallot. And now we're going to get some more oil on the heat. So again, we uh, apply the pan to the heat and a wee bit of oil to the pan. And we're going to Sweat off the onions and the shallot in the pan. Once the oil heats up a wee bit, which is probably about now. I thought so. Oh yes, there we go. I love the fact that someone commented on one of the videos that when things were frying, it sounded like applause. <laughs> well, it is actually. It's that we've got our socially distanced audience out in the garden there, you know, applauding madly. Ah, oh, go, go, Bal, go, Joe. That's not as good as the other pan. No, it's not as good as the other pan, but hey, you work with what you've got. Okay, um, at this point I'm going to add the rosemary. How are you? Yes, but it's nice to have the rosemary cooked off, because I tend to take the rosemary out, because it's not the nicest thing to bite into when you're eating the finished stew, so 
at this point we'll put the rosemary in so we get the nice fragrance of the rosemary through the stew. Well that's interesting, I wouldn't have put it in until you put all the liquid in. Mm. I would have taken it out again but... Mm -hmm. I'm also going to do the garlic. Some people say you're quite clumsy with your right hand as well. <laughs> it's so witty. Jeez. It's a very garlicky garlic, but it's also very disinclined to be squeezed. It's a wee bit old, that garlic. Now you turn on me. Well, you bought it. Oh, so this is burning. It's sticking to the bottom. Yeah. Which just transferred it to the other. It's not quite so hot. There's a lovely smell in this kitchen right now, though. Onion and rosemary and garlic. Mmm. Absolutely beautiful. Okay, and we'll do that a wee minute. While that's happening, we'll just chop up the carrots. And then I'm going to add the carrots to the pan. That'll all come off when you add the liquid, I mm -hmm. think. So, I'm going to put the meat back into the pan. No. It's very difficult for me to film. Don't give me your technical problems. Oh god, that smells amazing. Mm. It's gonna get even better. You could put some of the chili liquid in to mm -hmm. deglaze a wee bit as well. Yep. Carrots, but never mind. So two star anise. I love just star anise. Give it a slightly aniseedy. So you could put a wee bit of fennel in as well. You could you? yes, you wouldn't need the star anise if you had a bit of fennel. Well, you can't have too much of that kind of flavour in my well. View. It's your opinion. Mm -hmm. I said in my view. You're entitled to it. Thank you. You can ignore it, but I'm yeah. entitled to it. Yeah. I'm so often that happens in this kitchen. What about the chilies? We're going to add the chilies now. Thank I think you should. You need to chop them up a wee bit, though. So these have been sitting marinated, not for very long, but just enough to give them a wee bit more moisture. Um, I've said ancho chilies, uh, smoky, tobacco-y, a little bit of warm, but not sort of grabby by the throat chilli heat. Shouldn't be, no. We've taken the seeds out, though, just as a precaution. Because they can be a bit bitter anyway. Mm -hmm. oh, look at that. It's going to add a lovely colour to it as well. It's going to be really mm -hmm. dark and rich. And... Yeah, this is going to come out of the oven practically black. Well, when I, the when I cooked it, it did come out black, of yeah, course. That's because you reduced the venison to lump chocolate. Well, I thought when we first moved in here that the bottom oven was something that you put things in overnight. You can put things in overnight provided you put enough moisture in with them. That was my problem. It did come out as charcoal, didn't it? It did. 
And then you said, oh, it'll be fine, we can just add some more liquid to it. And that was just, then it was charcoal floating in water. Well, I thought it must be a little bit like, um, you know, biltong or jerky or something, and you could just add water and it would rehydrate. So now it's time for the wine. As you can see, I've put a generous amount of wine in, probably about a half bottle. Maybe a wee bit more. Good luck. None of that little splash of red wine. What we're going to do is boil the spoons to boil mm -hmm. because we need to burn off the alcohol because we don't want the alcohol taste in the finished casserole. Now, do we need any stock or anything in this? Uh, we don't really need stock in this because we've got the, the, the lovely juices of the venison and we've got the red wine. Um, so what I'm just going to do is add some salt and pepper. Um, and I'm probably going to add my secret ingredient, fleur de sel with mm. mushroom powder in it. Because uh, I like it. It's good that. Uh -huh. Get a little on that. But, uh, this, is, this is worth using it on. I can't remember where I bought that. I brought it. I brought it back from somewhere for you. Did I get it in America? And then we're going to have black pepper. The secret of seasoning is not to do it too much too soon because you can always add later as you serve it. Not everyone has the same taste in terms of saltiness and pepperiness. So you have to leave a bit of room for manoeuvre there. So as you can see what we have here is a pretty vigorous rolling boil. Um, and that's the time to let the alcohol bubble off for a wee while, just a, just a minute or so. Let it bubble away. Yeah, so you can still taste the tang of the alcohol, it needs to be a bit longer. Will that not happen in the oven as well? Well, that will as well, but you ideally want to get most of the alcohol off now. Uh, some recipes actually ask you to use de-alcoholised wine. And I use de-alcoholised wine when I make a pheasant casserole because it seems to work better. And that basically just means that you boil up the wine in a pan beforehand uh, and boil off the alcohol and let it cool down. So you've got all the flavours of the wine, but you don't have the, the intensity of the alcohol uh, seeping into the dish. Seems like an awful waste of all the alcohol. You're not wanting the alcohol for the alcohol's sake. You're wanting the, the wine for the mm, richness of flavours it brings. So you couldn't just add grape juice then? No. Because <laughs> grape juice doesn't taste like wine. <laughs> Alcohol-free wine? I don't know what that Why tastes like. That? Why would you do that? Why would you do that? That's just insane. So I'm going to put this in the low oven for couple of hours. Again, I don't know if you've got an oven, low oven, couple of hours. Uh, if you haven't got access to an oven, you can cook it on a very low heat on the stove top. Um, especially good if you've got one of those uh, heat diffusers that you can put over your gas ring. It's very low and spreads the heat out a bit. Um, and so that's where we're going to leave it for now. And we'll be back later. So I've got the stew out of the oven now. It smells amazing, by the way. Oh, it tastes amazing too. I'm going to remove the rosemary, which I was going to do earlier, but then I forgot. Put it up. Okay. And you're probably wondering what happened to the pickled walnuts, which were announced at the start of the process, but haven't been referred to since. Well, not really. Here are the pickled walnuts. I mean, not really. This is an attentive audience. They pay attention, unlike you. It's my recipe, sort of. So I'm going to take these pickled walnuts. Look at them, when you cut them in half, they look like brains. Just going to cut them up a wee bit. They give an interesting oh. flavour and texture. A bit of sharpness, a bit of sweetness. Just like brains. So you can add the, the pickling juice to add a wee bit of sweetness and sharpness, is that right? Yeah, and I'm going to do a little bit of that once I've stuck these in the mix. Oh, the dead walnut brains. And how long was your stew in before you just took it out just now? It was in for two hours. Two hours. Gosh, it's two hours gone past already. Mm -hmm. It's just now time flies when you're enjoying yourself. I wanted to try a wee bit of the 
Ben şimdi o. Oh. And a wee bit sweet. It's quite sweet as well. And you're going to add any more of your chili soaking water? No, I don't think so because there's a little bit of chili heat in this, and I think it's just about right. So I think anything more would not be an improvement at this point. So I'm gonna see. Let's come back through the boil, and then we put it back in the oven for a wee bit longer, probably about another half hour or so. Are you gonna leave the lid a wee bit open so it reduces a bit? No. Okay. Because when you can't keep an eye on it in the oven, you can reduce it too much. It's easier. <coughs> Oh, quick, put it under the tap, put it under the tap, put it under the tap, put it under the tap. Oh. Do I need to do a public health warning about the dangers of picking up things that have been in the oven? Yeah, yeah. You're right? Yes, I'm fine. Yeah. Do you want me to, I've got, I, I know how to bandage. I've, done my, I've got my first aid training. I've got the bandage, I've got less stupidity. I'm about to, as I was saying, it's easy enough to reduce it on the top of the stove when you take it out if it still needs more reduction. What you can't do is put the liquid back once you've lost it. As I discovered. As I discovered. So I'm going to stick this back in the bottom of them for a bit longer, maybe half an hour or so. So the magic moment, time to take it out of the oven. Put your oven gloves on first. It's going to be hot. Oven gloves. Non-chickeny oven gloves. Yay! It's taken all season, but we've got hygiene at the end. The moment of truth. Oh yes, look at that. It's lovely. Oh, that looks unctuous. Could possibly be lovely. reduced a wee bit yeah, more. Probably be reduced a wee bit more by the time we come to eat it because what we're going to do now is let it sit because as we know, it's a well-known fact that everything improves with sitting. I thought sitting was the new smoking. I don't even understand that. Sitting's the new smoking. It's supposed to be the new da most dangerous thing you can do. Oh, right. For your health. Well, not, that's... If you have, not if you have venison stew. Oh, that's quite spicy. That's nice. Mm, nice. Yeah. Mmm. So that's lovely. We'll be having that for our dinner later on. It's lovely with mashed potatoes. It's lovely with chunks of bread to dip in it. And it's very lovely with a big pile of buttered cabbage, which is what we hope we'll have later on. So, venison stew, enjoy it. <laughs>